It's winner take all as we wrap up the Better Call Saul season. Join me as I have another Basement Breakdown. Okay, season four, episode 10, winner. We have arrived. Um, fantastic finale. Let's get right into it. What I want to do today is uh, sort of show you Jimmy's state of mind, the state of his character before these climactic final scenes. And then we're going to take a look at Kim uh, and the way that their paths uh, intersect in this uh, tragic manner. Um, let's start with Jimmy. I don't want to talk. The cold open. We see Chuck again. And when we start out, we see Jimmy, you know, we have this blue cast over everything. And Jimmy is side by side with Chuck in his brother's realm. Blue, the law. This is where uh, Chuck holds court, literally and figuratively, right? Um, and Jimmy gets to join him here. Compare that to later in the cold open, uh, Jimmy's encouraging Chuck to come up and sing karaoke. Um, and finally, Chuck gets up there and gets so swept up in it that he grabs the microphone from Jimmy uh, and finishes finishes the song himself. The winner takes it all uh, by ABBA. Note the point where Chuck grabs the microphone from Jimmy. It comes right after um, the lyric. But I was a fool. Playing by the rules. This is the moment when Chuck grabs the microphone um, He's not playing by the rules here. It's not his turn to sing, um, but he's going to break the rules. He's going to be spontaneous. He's going to please the crowd. He's a better singer than Jimmy, after all, right? Chuck never does this type of thing. You know, as Jimmy says later at his reinstatement uh, appeal, you know, Chuck was the guy who was always right. And here, he's letting his hair down. He's working the crowd. We're seeing a little bit of Jimmy McGill in Chuck the same way we saw a little bit of Chuck and Jimmy McGill um, at the uh, bar ceremony. I don't even know what you call that. But um, in this cold open, we see some of the brothers in each other. And you better believe Jimmy's seeing it. How elated is he when Chuck is belting out this song? At the same time, earlier in the karaoke session, Jimmy, it's like this song was written for this episode, honestly. Jimmy starts off the karaoke session with the lyric, I don't want to talk about things we've gone through, though it's hurting me, now it's history. This describes Jimmy's state of mind at this moment. He's moved past his conflicts with Chuck, now that's history. It also describes Jimmy in a, in a uh, more sad way throughout this whole season. He doesn't want to talk about the things he's been through, even though he really needs to. As far as he's concerned, now that's history. A lot of meaning in that lyric. But the key point is, is that these brothers are seeing themselves in each other on this day. Then we get back to Jimmy's apartment. Not blue cast anymore. Now Chuck's in Jimmy's realm, right? We have this gold cast on, on everything in Jimmy's apartment. We're bathed in it. Um, Chuck's in Jimmy's realm. All Jimmy talks about at the apartment is symmetry, pairs. Um, he talks about HHMM after they just sang an ABBA song, ABBA. There seems to be symmetry everywhere. He talks about his eyes, his, his legs, his nipples. His message is, What's more natural? What is more, what belongs more to the natural state of the world than for us to be two brothers who are matched side by side? Symmetry or symmetricality, as uh, the drunken Jimmy puts it, right? And yet there's two kinds of symmetry at work here, isn't there? Jimmy's describing this symmetry of a matched pair, mirrored, duplicated, but that lyric from the song, winner takes it all, loser has to fall, there's also that sort of yin-yang, zero-sum symmetry, right? And it all builds up to this really striking final shot of the cold open. We're pulling away from the two brothers, and they're closer, literally and figuratively, than they ever have been in their adult lives at this moment. And yet, look at the directionality of how they're composed on the bed here. Jimmy, his hand is literally pointing in one direction, and Chuck's hand positioned in, in mirrored fashion, pointing the other direction. Jimmy's tie spilling off the side of the bed. Chuck's gaze going in the other direction. Yes, they're together, but we also see the omen of how they will diverge. Because this zero-sum winner and loser symmetry is the, is the dynamic that comes to dominate their relationship, isn't it? One of them has to win, and the other one has to lose. Not only has it destroyed them, 
but it's picked up collateral damage in the form of Howard and in Kim. I mean, Kim's been wrecked multiple times by this dynamic between the brothers, and in fact is destroyed one last time at the end of this episode um, as Jimmy has his what he views as his final victory over Chuck, right? But let's stick with Jimmy uh, for a little bit more. Um, this speech to the scholarship candidate. You were never going to get it. We have talked about on the breakdown how um, a well-written monologue can often be speaking to two people at once. And I think we all know as we watch this that Jimmy is not talking just about Christy, just to Christy, right? He's talking about himself, to himself. I mean, you can detect it even when they're in the boardroom and he's making the argument for Christy. He's really making an argument for um, his own redemption, right? He believes that he should be able to redeem himself after the mistakes he's made, and he projects this onto Christie, this candidate. Jimmy hits on some key themes that define his state of mind right now. You know, he says, remember, the winner takes it all. Remember, the winner takes it all, duplicating that line from the song earlier, except it sounds very different as a solo than as a duet, right? Before, Chuck and Jimmy were both winners in the cold open. That was the greatest day of Jimmy's life as far as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. He was there with Chuck and everybody could win. It wasn't a zero sum game. But in this speech to Christy, that same line takes on a much more cynical and ruthless tone because of the way Jimmy frames it. He also says, here's a key line, as far as they're concerned, that mistake is who you are. In the boardroom, when Jimmy brings up Christy's name, Esposito, that's the shoplifter. Oh, she's the shoplifter. She is identified by her one mistake. And Jimmy says, that's your life now. It gets at what he regards as this unjust permanence of identity. Rightly so, he views that as unfair. And so much of his life lately has been rebelling about that and um, expressing his belief that you should be able to discard that identity and fire up a new one uh, at will, basically. Also... Jimmy says, the higher you rise, the more they're going to hate you. And he goes like this with his hand. He duplicates the hand motions that I've been making on the breakdown all year with high and low stuff. Um, Jamie, my producer, made fun of me last week after I broke out the hand gestures again. But now Jimmy's even doing it. He says, the higher you raise, the more they're going to hate you. High and low. Jimmy needs to be higher so that he can rub their noses in it, as he puts it. But the next scene, the low reality of his life hits him. He's in the basement, the HHM basement, the low P3, the lowest level of their parking garage. He's as far down as you can get, and his car won't start. He literally cannot move from the bottom rung of HHM, and in his uh, view, the bottom rung of society, hence his breakdown. I will note, the second basement breakdown in, in as many weeks uh, on Better Call Saul, nicely dovetailing with the series we've got here. Um, the point is, he's on the bottom and he's not going anywhere. And to him, this is his true fate. This is how he sees himself, uh, thanks in part to Chuck, but also thanks in large part to his own unwillingness to break out of that narrative that he's constructed for himself. <laughs> now let's talk about Kim. The word that comes to mind to me at the beginning of this episode is, is mastermind, um, as far as Kim's concerned. Look, we're at a point where Kim concocted the Huell Babineau scheme, right? I think probably she did a lot of the thinking on the Lubbock City Planning Office heist that they pulled off. Uh, and we know she initiated this plan because the end of the previous episode was her saying, let's start with you wanting to be a lawyer. So she's been masterminding these plans. It's almost like the student has become the master, right? Uh, and very much so. She's overseeing him at the cemetery as they start to lay the groundwork for grieving Jimmy, the image of grieving Jimmy. You know, even when he wants a snack, she says, you got to pace yourself. At the reading room event, she tells him not to eat. In both of these scenes, she's like even controlling what he ingests, all right? Kim is in charge. Um, he comes up with this outlandish scheme even while they're talking outside the uh, Charles McGill reading room event. And all she has to do is stare at him and he just withdraws his crazy like fire in the courthouse scheme, which, okay, that, that is crazy, but she doesn't even have to say anything. She shuts it down with a look. Kim is very much in control of what's happening here and she's enjoying the hell out of herself, isn't she? Because look, 
She's thrilled with the, with the power of duping people with a story that she writes herself, right? And as Rich Schweikert says at the, at the Chuck McGill event, practically the whole Southwest legal community is here. All the top minds, all the high status people in her legal community are there and she's putting one over on all of them. She's at the pinnacle of her, of her underhanded storytelling game here. Loving it. There's a pivotal moment then at Kim and Jimmy's house. Jimmy goes to get out Chuck's letter and says, let's, you know, basically let's let Chuck do make my case for me. Now, my expectation here, I don't know about you, was that Kim would recoil in horror as she and Howard have done at different points in this season, including the first time uh, Jimmy read this letter. She's horrified by um, how unaffected he is by the letter. And I expected her to be horrified when he pulls it out and he's gonna use it to his own advantage. Um, and yet she's not. She looks at him and she seems to be not only on board with his idea, but and look, I'm reading into it here, but she seems to have an idea of her own. My notion is that the letter presents perhaps the ultimate mastermind moment for Kim, because she now sees how she's going to guide him to this public catharsis. Think about it. Kim knows there's this dark pit in Jimmy from the loss of Chuck that he has not contended with. Um, in fact, he's actively avoided contending with it. Kim keeps saying, you have to talk about Chuck. You should go to therapy. Um, let it out. She hasn't been able to get through to him. And now she has an opportunity, okay, if he can't have therapy, maybe the next best thing is public catharsis, right? She's going to have him read this letter, and she encourages him literally to have a real and emotional response. And I think that Kim's hope here is not only to get Jimmy reinstated, but also for him to have a real not just sincere seeming, but a real emotional moment as he revisits this letter, maybe the breakthrough that she's been looking for when she encouraged him to go to therapy, when she tries to engage him about Chuck. And she needs that, doesn't she? Because she needs to see that Jimmy McGill soul um, that everybody else denies is there. You know, she said to the assistant DA a few episodes ago, you don't know the whole story. And that's what Kim has been saying all along about Jimmy. You don't know Jimmy like I do, but she needs some verification right now that Jimmy's still in there, that that soul's still in there. And if he has this real emotional moment reading the letter, she'll get the verification that she needs. It's all coming together for Kim in this moment. All that's left is for us to hear your prepared statement. So It's like her very conception of and love for Jimmy is at stake in this hearing. I'm sorry, I can't do this. Why doesn't Jimmy read the letter? The way the plan is drawn up, the McGill brothers are joining forces, right? Chuck wrote a great letter, they say outside the hearing room. But it's all gonna come down to how Jimmy reads it. What could be more perfect? Chuck's words, Jimmy's performance. We're playing to both of the brothers' strengths. It's the last McGill team effort. I was gonna try to move you all with my brother's eloquent words. But the song is, the winner takes it all. Jimmy doesn't wanna share the spoils with Chuck. You know, he doesn't wanna give victory to that smug, regal Chuck McGill he saw staring down at him from that portrait on the wall at HHM, right? No, Jimmy's gonna be the sole winner here. So he puts the letter back in his pocket. Um, or actually, no, he uses it as a prop, but he stops reading it. He's gonna win with his own words and his own performance. And it turns out to be more effective than even the letter would have been, and crucially, Kim is more moved than anyone else in the room. The whole panel is in tears or on the verge of them, uh, and Kim is tearing up more than any of them, which sets us up for this final scene. Kim emerges with Jimmy. Great performance from the both of them in this scene, but Ray Seahorn really sticks out. Kim emerges with Jimmy. They're both jubilant. Kim has the biggest smile maybe we've ever seen on her face. She thinks they're sharing in the exhilaration of not just success, but a real emotional reckoning that happened uh, at that podium. As the instant that Jimmy says, you see those suckers? That one asshole was crying. He had actual How about tears. those suckers? And how about that asshole on the panel who was actually crying? Her face falls. And she's reckoning with the fact that she has been duped. She has been spending the back half of this season delighting in duping the people around her, the sophisticated, high-status people around her. And now the tables have been turned. She has been duped on a matter 
of, of huge importance to her. Jimmy's soul, right? It was all just another story, and she was duped by it. She was crying as much as anyone. Um, and as Jimmy talks about how about those assholes, she realizes she's one of those assholes. The Jimmy McGill she knew, or thought she knew at least, she's probably not even sure it was ever there, but the Jimmy McGill she thought she knew is now dead. Jimmy's a transformed person in this scene, isn't he? Watch the performance by Bob Odenkirk. Even the way he snarls, suckers and assholes, the language is a little more coarse than we're accustomed to hearing Jimmy use. The way he calls the courthouse staffer sweetheart. It's like he's inhabiting a new character, which of course he is, right? We see it when Jimmy turns around and points at her in that slick TV commercial way, and he flashes that hollow-eyed grin and says, Saul Goodman. Now, look, this is, the, this is the phrase from back in Cicero that Jimmy turned into his name, Saul Goodman, but I think it has an added resonance with Kim because throughout the series, we've seen Jimmy say again and again to Kim, don't worry, just relax, I'll take care of it. When he wants her out of his business and he wants to basically dip below the line of the legitimate, do something underhanded. Um, and he always pushes her away at those moments by saying, hey, relax, I'll take care of it. Saul Goodman is just another variation of that. And it's this um, explicit drawing of distance between them and it's confirmation, Jimmy's dead. You're looking at Saul Goodman right here, okay? Hence, Kim's shock uh, as we, I mean, what about that isolated shot of her that ends the season with the camera pulling away, you know, with the wall encroaching on her in that shot? It reminded me of... Um, that moment we highlighted earlier in the year in the breakdowns when uh, an episode ended with Kim closing the door on Jimmy and, um, and it covered up half of him. Similarly, it feels like Jimmy slash Saul almost closing the door on Kim and maybe even the show closing the door on Kim a little bit. I want to highlight one last line before we go. Jimmy says to Kim, you were, right. you were right. It was all about Chuck the whole time. You were right. You were right. It was all about Chuck the whole time in his, you know, effervescence after this hearing. There's two different ways to read that line, and it corresponds to the two different characters here. Jimmy's saying it in the sense that Chuck was the obstacle to being reinstated. He was the obstacle to Jimmy getting his power back, right? But it was all about Chuck the whole time could really describe how Kim views Jimmy's struggles, his anger, his inability to succeed even when he's given the chance. Kim looks at Jimmy and says, all this failure, it was all about Chuck the whole time. But Jimmy either doesn't see that or refuses to see that. And so necessarily, Jimmy dies too. I think without a little bit of Chuck, Jimmy can't go on living. Hence Saul Goodman. You know, the two brothers are more intimately linked than either of them would want to admit. And with Chuck banished altogether from Jimmy's existence, he didn't read the letter. He made up his own story. Jimmy dies too. And so we have the beginning of the Saul Goodman era by all appearances. It's an incredibly moving end to a great season. Look, this show is a work of art when it comes down to the writing, the cinematography, the performance, every aspect of it. It's been a privilege to break it down with you every week here. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, and hey, subscribe to O-Logical because we're not going to stop here. The season may be over, but there will be more breakdowns. There's going to be more fun on the O-Logical channel. You guys have helped me understand the show so much better uh, with your comments and your tweets and whatnot. Uh, and I hope I've done a little of the same for you. That does it for The Basement Breakdowns, Season 4 of Better Call Saul. Thanks again for joining us. I'll see you soon. So long. <laughs>